morning. Uh, my name is Paulo Vila da Cunha, and I'm a member of the Board of Directors of the Chamber. And in the name of the Chamber, I would like to welcome you to today's event. Um, I would also like to thank PHU Law and David Magogatos uh, for sponsoring and organizing this event. Welcome to everyone. For, uh, thank you for joining us on this you know, cold morning. Crypto and blockchain, first and foremost. Uh, blockchain really is a cryptography technology. How you encrypt things. The way I think the easiest way to define it is basically it's a way for digital information to get distributed but not copied. Before this, there's no way that I can send a digital copy of my hundred dollar bill to my cousin in California. And that being the $100 bill, with this technology, is a way for digital information to get distributed widely, but not copied. Now, that cryptography, that technology is built on a set of databases. Imagine a million computers. Each has the same exact database. Whenever you update one computer, everywhere else, the information is updated. And they all have different architecture on how do you secure a database in your own computer, when to update. That's the different blockchain protocol. Bitcoin is the very first architecture on this technology. And the token used on that Bitcoin architecture is the Bitcoin token that everyone knows about. And it just happened that there's a limited number of them, 21 million to be exact. But on top of that, then there's a different set uh, that you can build on smart contracts, which are rules that can manipulate this architecture to add on different functionality, self-execution, etc. So that's how over time you have Bitcoin, and you have Ethereum, which carries with its smart contract capability, and then you have more and more and more protocols on top of it. One way to look at the notion of smart contracts and different tokens outside of Bitcoin, essentially it's like an app that's getting built, a different operating system. You have the iOS, the iPhone operating system, and then on top of that, there are more apps that can be built on top of it. Stable coins are basically coins that are pegged supposedly exactly to a currency like the USD. Meaning you have a bunch of these things, USDC, USDT, based on different mechanism that they're supposedly, when you transfer them, they're equivalent to a US dollar. I'll give you one very simple example. So my family immigrated from Vietnam. My mom used to send back $100 to her sister and it would cost $25 in fees to get $100 to a small village in Vietnam. You now can send 100 USDC to Vietnam or Brazil or Peru everywhere in you know pretty much a few seconds at a fraction of a cost, a few cents in order to see that through. So the great efficiency that comes with the ability to send digital information but that exact copy would fundamentally transform financial services and many other sectors as well. Let me uh, just spend a couple minutes on NFT and then I'll, uh, I'll return the mic. Uh, NFT stands for non-fungible tokens in that across the board, within an architecture in a chain, non-fungible tokens mean it's the only one copy of itself Bitcoin, one Bitcoin and another Bitcoin is interchangeable. One Ethereum and another Ethereum is interchangeable. One US dollar bill and another US dollar bill is interchangeable in value, but they're actually not interchangeable. I think there's a number and a code attached to each and every single dollar bill in a physical form. So very much in that sense. So I'll give an example. If Michelangelo I don't know, appears again miraculously, and paint digitally a hundred copies of the Mona Lisa and encrypted, there will forever only 100 copies of the digital Mona Lisa that I can send over to Marcos, he can send to his cousin. Sure, Felipe can on his phone make a copy 
just take a screenshot of it, it looks close enough, but it is not the same. And when you receive the original copy, you can actually, you would know it. So that's a very simple way to authenticate and expedite KYC, AML, uh, you know, fraud of prevention, when you go to a game, whether the New York Mets or otherwise, or a soccer game, the tickets digitally can be authenticated at ease. That's the whole universe of NFTs, and I think there's a longer conversation uh, in how, I think, over time, that intersection between arts and entertainment and finance uh, will be a new industry and asset class in a way that we haven't yet perceived today. Um, Brazil has one of the largest and fastest growing markets for crypto in the world. Um, Marcos, I just wonder if you could tell us a little bit about what the Brazilian government's um, perspective is and, and something about the new regulatory regime. Well, the Brazilian uh, crypto law uh, began back in 2015 when the first bill of law was presented uh, to the Brazilian uh, lower chamber of uh, the Brazilian Congress. And then it floated around for almost six and a half years, and many other uh, subsequent bills of law were also presented. Um, and, but only in December 2021, it was finally approved by the, uh, by the Brazilian lower chamber, the Câmara dos Deputados, and it was sent to the Brazilian Senate. And then it was approved by the Brazilian Senate in, uh, in April 2022. Uh, the Senate made several changes to, to the bill, uh, two of which uh, were uh, quite significant and resulted from a lot of lobbying from uh, the Brazilian incumbent, incumbent companies. Um, to try and, and ward off the, uh, uh, the presence of uh, international companies, international exchanges that were already operating in Brazil, taking the market, but uh, without complying, fully complying with, uh, with Brazilian law. Then this, uh, in May, this uh, the the bill returned to the to the lower chamber, and then in November it was finally approved the final text, and many uh, many of the changes that were made by the Senate were eventually removed from the final draft of the bill, uh, and two of which we're going to speak a bit about it uh, later on, and the bill of law was finally sanctioned in December 21, uh, 2022, and published in uh, December 22nd. And as it has a, a vacancy of 180 days, it will uh, only become effective now uh, on, in, on June 20th, uh, 2023. We still do not have a um, designated regulator. We expect it to be the Central Bank of Brazil, uh, but now we know from uh, information that we've gotten from the, the Ministry of Finance of Finance of Brazil, that uh, this uh, this regulation will be enacted very soon and probably maybe even to, uh, tomorrow or uh, the next week, uh, dividing a little, splitting a little bit the the, the jurisdictions. Probably the the, the CBM will uh, eventually regulate exchanges, uh, issuers, uh, and the like and the Central Bank of Brazil will end up regulating the rest. The scope of the Brazilian uh, crypto law is interesting because it's, it provides guidelines. It's not a very detailed, uh, it's not a very detailed law. Uh, it just provides, well, you have to follow these guidelines uh, and it, it, is, it will be up to the regulator to enact the fine print, and, uh, and this is good because the regulator will be able to keep up with innovation uh, in the space, which, is, which occurs very fast. Um, so it's essentially uh, uh, guidelines on the provision of virtual asset services and the regulation of virtual asset service provider, providers, the VASPs. But this is a very important issue for those who uh, are willing to enter the Brazilian crypto space 
is that uh, the law requires prior authorization to operate in Brazil uh, <coughs> as of the effectiveness of the law. Therefore, as of June 20th, only the companies which are already in activity will be able to continue to operate without a license. Those which are not will have to wait until regulation is, is actually enacted uh, and they will have to follow through with uh, an authorization process. Uh, and, and this will very likely take uh, quite a bit of time, maybe one to two years. So whoever is uh, willing to enter Brazil uh, now needs to uh, be active, be in operation before uh, June 20th. Uh, it doesn't have to be a big operation. You have to be able to to say that you are in activity because uh, Article 2nd of, uh, of, the, of the law provides that you, you are required, uh, you require a prior authorization <coughs> and Article 9, which is a grandfather provision, provides that only those in activity may continue to operate. So this is very important and, and this is something that not many people are paying attention to. Before 2018, crypto was still a toxic subject in the Brazilian financial community. I think before 2018, the P3, right, the local stock exchange had attempted to launch a futures contract. The, the central bank stopped them right, you know, before departure. Uh, that's when we were starting to idealize hashtags, and, and early on we had that vision of building large-scale, tremendous quality, passive products that would be accessible by all kinds of investors in Brazil and then elsewhere. In 2018, the local securities regulator, so the CVM, started to issue some, you know, these memos, which really amounted to a regulatory interpretation of the rules that already existed. And Hashtags was able to piggyback on this and start advancing products really to the benefit of investors. In these five years, Peter, uh, I think we've, we've been able to collaborate with not just regulators, but a number of players in the ecosystem to keep pushing the environment forward. What we're seeing now, with the enactment of the law last year, as Mark was described in detail really well, what we're seeing now, it's, it's not directly related, uh, but super, super, uh, like, close to the matter of the choices. The, the central bank's plans for CDBC, I think, is, in a number of ways, a result of a, a an evolution that we've seen happen, and I'm proud to say hashtags in a number of ways has pushed this too. But we were really proud when, Marcos, what's the name of our new CVM commissioner? And so when João Pedro was, when João Pedro was uh, you know, having his hearing at the Senate, he mentioned explicitly that one of his priorities was digital assets, and he mentioned you know, explicitly how the market in Brazil had evolved with the creation of the ETFs, which was something that hashtags began a while ago. Uh, throughout these five years, what we've met, Peter, and, and I think this is what sets Brazil apart from, I thought most countries, but literally every country now, Marcos was saying how Brazil is one of the beacons in terms of crypto uh, innovation and openness to crypto. I'm convinced it's like the best country in the world right now with regards to this. Yeah. Uh, was a pragmatic and you know collaborative attitude of regulators and even incumbents to work while the regulatory clarity wasn't there. So when we when we uh, came to the CVM with the idea we want to launch a, a an ETF, they didn't shut us off. They're like, you know, how can we do, what's the case? And one of our main cases is, hey, CPM, this is a powerful way to protect everyday investors who right now are being caught into the funnel of Bitcoins. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and you have the chance to make an impact in this. And they, I think, 
unlike the SEC, which seems to get stuck in, in its old rules and a very stubborn position, uh, right? They get, how can we make this work? And even without the regulatory clarity, the CVM, Central Bank, Ambima, which is Brazil's industry self-regulating body, uh, the local stock exchange, big players such as XP, BTG, Itaú, Genial, we had a number of partners contributing to this. We look for ways to make it work under existing rules. And I think, you know, success has been tremendous so far. Brazil is a hotbed of activity and innovation in the crypto asset investment space. Uh, FTX, um, I probably have a, uh, you know, I know, probably a less popular view about it. I don't think it's in any way an indictment on the industry. It's not an indictment on the technology. FTX essentially is a bank and a trading firm. Supposedly highly regulated, you know, quantitative derivative products. You have a 20 year or something that's operating a firm with no board of directors, no CFO, no control, that you can send billions of dollars out and in and conflating without any check. It's like putting a three-year-old child behind an 18-wheeler and drive down Fifth Avenue at 18 miles an hour. What do you think is gonna happen? Is it the truck's fault? No. Is it Fifth Avenue's fault? No. It's the investors who look at the lack of control and still pump money into it. So I think here, the Tiger Global, the A16Z, the Sequoia, are as responsible for the hundreds of thousands of investors losing money at FTX, including myself. Republic and myself personally, and I told all of my siblings to put some money and deposit them on FTX. They actually, they're so clueless, they didn't even know the FTX imploded. <laughs> you know, they all Let's not tell them. physicians, so I haven't gotten the, the bad phone calls yet. But, yeah, but, but I really think the space at the end of the day is if you are going to manage in any industry, in any financial firm, if you're going to run and deal with client assets to the tune of any amount, but to the tune of tens and then hundreds and billions of dollars, those controls and compliance framework got to be in place. So I really think it's a, an unfortunate thing for the industry that it sets investor confidence back. Uh, but I think, you know, it's a, a momentary, uh, you know, peaks and valley, but the overall traction for the industry is continuing to go up. So obviously, like you guys said, here in the U.S., Kraken was affected by the lack of regulatory clarity. But what about a bank like Concordia, who is doing everything right, has over 108% of collateral of their funds, and yet they're having huge trouble to like actually make it in the U.S.? And then, second part, would there be a Concordia Brazil? Is there something like that there? Could it succeed based on the new laws that have been put in place? I have a couple of tidbits. So, I, I, I don't know the details about Concordia. I, at a broad level, I think it's been a victim of this general attitude towards, you know, I'll be just as restrictive as I can, applying old laws to this new problem. And when FTX blew up, the reaction was, oh God, what would, instead of asking, you know, regulators asking, what was my role in this? How can I make it better the second time? They just doubled down on being even more restrictive. This is what I've what I've you know, heard through the grapevines. Uh, and secondly, Marcus will probably be a lot better to, than giving color, but I'll tell you what I've been witnessing from afar. Is that, remember I mentioned five years ago, crypto was toxic. And you know, banks would not talk about crypto. Like today, Itaú launched, Itaú has an ETF, a Bitcoin ETF, in the stock exchange. Itaú is the largest financial conglomerate in Brazil, probably Latin America. Uh, a very traditional conservative bank. After the passage of the Congress Act, we know that every bank is moving to be positioned in digital assets. Finally, it will be the central bank who will be appointed as the final regulator. Once rules are out, banks will start offering custody services, they'll start offering trading services, they will uh, do a lot of concordial like things. So, I have, maybe I'll get, I, I, we, hashtag, we have a vision, I'll share some of this now, Peter, shut me up if I'm talking too much, that Brazil can become a global beacon in the digital asset space because of all of this positive attitude from regulators, and frankly, this is self-serving, but it, it, it's not just us, hashtags, 
very rich community of entrepreneurs trying to push the environment forward. I think in, in a foreseeable future, we will have robust and regulated markets for spot products. The B3 is bringing back futures. We, have, uh, we will have regulated banks doing custody, doing trading, doing all the prime brokerage services that we've grown accustomed to in, in, in sophisticated capital markets. Uh, we we'll have the ETFs, and if that exists in Brazil alone and nowhere else, guess where investors around the globe will choose to go when they want to take a position in the category. So I think it's a big opportunity for Brazil, and, and, and thanks to you know those minds out there, we're, doing, we're going on the right path. So I'm Bruna Santos, uh, director of the Brazil Institute at the Wilson Center. And it's a think tank, so I spent a lot of my time thinking about how to redesign institutions. And I want to hear from you how you think that all the, like this relation and uh, all the advancements that Brazil has in that front may or may not uh, create a portal towards like rethinking governance, especially with the opportunity of DAOs, creating DAOs, and working with smart contracts to redefine certain, uh, not only public, but also private institutions. Because I think one thing that is, Brazil is very similar to the U.S. today is that we are advancing in certain parts of our society, but uh, we, it's more and more difficult to get things done because we created like institutions that are so difficult to operate. So I want to hear from, from your, your thoughts about it. <coughs> well, <coughs> Brazil, as you know, uh, has one of the most uh, digitized um, financial systems in the world, not because we're better than every, everybody else, but uh, because we have, uh, we used to have very high inflation rates uh, in the 80s and 90s, so the money could not sleep in accounts. So uh, we, we got digitized and, and uh, very quickly. Nowadays, well, before the PIX, the PIX is a real-time uh, payment scheme that is run by the central bank. Uh, it's like a zelly, but ran by the central bank, and everybody has access to it. Every uh, financial and payment institution has access to it. All the population has, in theory, access, uh, that has uh, access to a bank account or a payment account, has access to the PIX. Uh, and it's, and it, it was actually inspired uh, by, by, by zelly. Uh, back in 2016, the, the, the then chairman of the of the Brazilian Ch uh, Central Bank, you know, Dolphin, uh, saw this and said, "This is great. Let's uh, let's implement this, but uh, run by the central bank." Um, so we have a very, and in addition to that, we have transfer systems that are very fast already. Uh, we we used to have. Uh, systems which are were already very fast. So if you were transferring funds from one account to a, of one bank to another account of another bank, by the time you left the application, the app of one bank and entered the, the other one, it, the, the, money is, uh, the money was already there. So Brazil has this, uh, this feature. Uh, we hear that many other countries are looking at the, the Brazilian example, including um, the United States, but the United States has a a different um, as a, banks are regulated uh, by by the by each state, uh, whereas in Brazil it's uh, a federal regulation, so it's much easier, and uh, so imposition is much more difficult uh, in in the for the reg, the federal regulator to impose on on um, low on state banks. But uh, I think it's, you know, good examples will, uh, should be followed. Uh, and I think, uh, for example, many countries are looking at the CBDC, Central Bank Digital Coins, as a way to adopt uh, real-time payments. And as for DAOs, I think this is a very good question because uh, nowadays, um, and we, we've seen this in, in the United States, that DAOs, and maybe Peter, I would like to, to hear what, what, what do you think on the, uh, of this. Uh, 
I think that there was a, a judicial decision saying, well, if you're a member of a DAO, you're not protected by any corporate veil because there is no corporate veil. So there's mm -hmm. no limited liability. So you, you will answer uh, with your assets to the full extent uh, because there's no corporate veil. There's no limited liability. And I think this is something that as DAOs become more and more frequent, it's very likely that uh, some sort of limitation will be will have to be implemented. I don't know. And this is this is something for you to yeah. to <laughs> think about. And thanking our panelists here, our experts for great discussion.